Nintendo makes a lot of good video game consoles. The NES, the Super Nintendo, the Nintendo 64, the Color TV Game 6... Wait, what? Okay, so maybe not everything Nintendo makes is gold. Actually, now that I think about it, Nintendo has a pretty infamous track record of... Why? As in, why would you make that? Why do you think anyone would ever play this? Why do my eyes hurt? Etc, etc. So while many people on YouTube will discuss and praise Nintendo's fun and successful consoles, allow me to take a look at the ones that didn't do so well, as we check out some of Nintendo's failed consoles. Our first game system is located in China. Yeah, wow. A country pretty infamous for their bootleg video games got an exclusive Nintendo console in 2003 called the IQ Player. Well, that's not a catchy name. Now, the name may not sound familiar, but the controller should definitely give you a sense of deja vu. That's because the IQ Player is a plug-and-play console for Nintendo 64 games. That's right. Not only is this the controller, but it's the console as well. Backstory. At one point, China attempted to outlaw and ban all video games. Why would you do that? So to combat this, Nintendo partnered up with one Chinese software developer to create this, a preloaded N64, with classic N64 titles like Super Smash Bros. and The Legend of Zelda. Only a total of 14 games were released throughout its lifespan. Dr. Mario 64 was the game that came preloaded with every console. It's just Dr. Mario 64, but in Chinese. If you wanted more of these games, you'd have to go to an IQ depot, usually located in gas stations and other convenient locations. You take out the memory card from the console, load it up into the depot, and download another game. It's such a fascinating concept. Essentially, this was an N64 classic but with extra effort to get the games. Speaking of which, there isn't much to say about the games themselves. They're all just ports of N64 games we all know and love, considering this is an official Nintendo creation. They put in love and care to make sure all the games ran well, which they do. The games look and feel exactly like they did on the N64, only it's all in Chinese so I don't know what's going on. That's the only difference. The controller is kind of weird and takes some getting used to, and there was even a weird multi-tap adapter that would allow for multiplayer games in Super Smash Bros. and Mario Kart 64. Overall, it's a pretty interesting piece of history, and this thing lived on until 2016 before it got discontinued. Despite its lengthy lifespan, however, it only sold between 8,000 to 12,000 units, and considering China's population, even in 2003 was 1.2 billion people, those aren't great numbers. Something about the N64 era really just stank of mediocrity, because up next we have the N64 disk drive, or the N64 DD. It was an add-on that connected to the bottom of the N64, making it this huge Frankenstein creation. Now let's pause right here, okay? If your console starts to even slightly resemble the Sega Genesis with the 32X and Sega CD, you've gone too far! Go back, backspace, hit the back button on this operation! The N64 DD was a very ambitious project. It would not only make your N64 games look prettier, and add a huge line of titles to be released to help legitimize the console, including Mother 3 and a main title Pokemon entry, but there was even online capabilities, and back in 1999, that was pretty ballsy. Getting to create your own avatar and interact with other people all around the world. Nintendo also wanted to add the ability to observe other players playing games, similar to watching a stream today. Listen to music, surf the internet, and shop online. What wasn't this thing going to do? The console was shown off at Nintendo Space World in 1995 and immediately raised some eyebrows due to its bulky look. But hey, there were some 64DD exclusive games released. Let's check some of them out. First up, we have Doshin the Giant. We appear. It's the big man. It's a giant. Oh my good god. I really hope that's his belly button. So this ugly, stretched out, yellow, abomination, gumby looking freak is Doshin. The giant would indeed grow bigger and further surprise the natives with his actions, both good and bad. He's a giant that shares an island with even creepier natives. What do you do exactly? Well, 
whatever you want. You can either pick up trees, help build homes, and do whatever you can to make the humans' lives easier. Or... You can be a menace and destroy everything! The game is classified as a god game, in which you can literally do whatever you want, similar to SimCity. Also, if this is god, then I don't know what life is anymore. Gah, these freaking humans making me do their chores. Picking up trees. I hate picking up trees. To be honest, I felt like I was on drugs during this entire experience. I guess it is kind of an impressive showcase of the disk drive, but it was even more of a showcase of what you can create while your mind is on drugs. <coughs> then there was Mario Artist Paint Studio, which is literally just Mario Paint on the N64. Then there's Mario Artist Polygon Studio, which is... Well, I have no earthly idea. The N64DD was only ever released in Japan, so we're just gonna have to wing it. We start off by selecting a cute but creepy smiley-faced box full of... things? Oh, okay, so was that what was in the box? Whatever, hey, I'm just going with the flow. Ah, okay, so this is a precursor to Farming Simulator, why didn't they just say that? I honestly have no clue what's going on. This tractor falls from the sky and automatically pilots itself off of a cliff, and I get a trophy for it? Don't reward me like that! After that segment's over, uh... You know what? I'm just gonna let you watch this next part and try to tell me what's going on. Please comment below on what is happening here. Eventually, we do come across this 3D modeling portion. Oh yeah, this game is called Mario Artist Polygon Studio. This section is honestly pretty interesting, especially for any kid who wanted to create video games and learn about the details of how it's done. Modeling, physics, all of that is right here and could have been a fantastic tool for kids to get an early start on game design. So yeah, the N64DD was critically panned and discontinued after a year and a half on store shelves. But fret not, because right around the corner, Nintendo was about to release... What's a game sphere? It's spherical! Nintendo really loves their handhelds. The Game Boy, the Game & Watch, the Pokemon... Mini? Wait, what? Oh yeah! The Pokemon Mini! This cute little device was a handheld console that strictly played Pokemon games. It's the smallest handheld with interchangeable cartridges that Nintendo has ever made. In typical Pokemon fashion, the systems were released in Wooper Blue, Chikorita Green, and Smoochum Purple. What's the difference between the three? Nothing. So what we have here are essentially a bunch of Pokemon-themed minigames. First up is Snorlax's Lunchtime. In this game, a bunch of food will fall from the sky, and we have to react by hitting the button as quickly as possible. But uh-oh, don't get too antsy, because occasionally there'll be a Pichu for some strange reason, and you don't want to eat that. I mean, maybe you don't, I don't know, they might be tasty. So that's pretty much the game. Tap, 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 don't tap. Up next is Slow King's Judge. Volleyballs come towards you, and if they're in the court, you hit the left button. If they're not, then you hit the right. These are not complex games. Here's Pokemon Pinball Mini. It's... It's definitely pinball. Oh, hey, come on now, there's kids playing this. Who invited Doshin? I mean, the Pokemon Mini is a really fun and interesting piece of hardware, but this came out in 2001, and has the same graphical and gameplay capabilities of the Game Boy that came out in 1989. Now, I'm not saying that the Pokemon Mini was bad by any means. Far from it. I had one when I was a kid and absolutely adored it. My favorite was always Rescue Mission. It was a puzzle game where you had to get the Pokemon to this randomly placed hole that would probably transport them to some, like, Puffin Vault or something. Like Squidward when he went to the Krusty Krab. It was actually really difficult and loads of fun. Long live the Pokemon Mini! Oh, it didn't. Okay. Alright, now let's talk about why we're really here today. The main event! Ladies and gentlemen, The Virtual Boy. Virtual Boy, see it now in 3D. 
Oh boy! This abomination of goggles and feet was known as the Virtual Boy. Released in 1995, this was meant to be the next big Nintendo portable console, keeping fans satisfied until the release of the well-anticipated Nintendo 64. But wait, portable? Yeah, like AVGN says, my ass is portable! How are you supposed to take this thing in public? And why would you even do that? Looking into it will transport you to the world of virtual reality! So, uh... So this is virtual reality. Get me out. Here we have Mario Tennis. A fine game, I guess. It would have been a lot better if it weren't on Virtual Boy. If you want to simulate VR, shouldn't I be playing from this view instead? Oh, actually, no, I'm gonna puke. Then we have Wario Land, which is actually a super fun game and would have been a hundred times better if it were released on the Super Nintendo or something. But again, the only 3D effects are when Wario jumps into the background, making him even more difficult to see. There's something about this black and red aesthetic that's just depressing. I don't know, somehow even on the Game Boy with its limited graphics, the world still felt like... worlds. Tetris! It's literally just Tetris. Remember what I said from a video before? Tetris is just a go-to game when you don't want to create anything new. I guess the only new addition is this guy on the startup screen. It looks like two kids standing on top of each other wearing a trench coat to look like an adult. Well, hey, if you're someone who likes Tetris, you're in luck, because there's another Tetris game on Virtual Boy. Virtual 3D Tetris. It's Tetris with a bird's eye view making it artificially more difficult and a hundred times more straining on the eyes. My eyes! Here's a pretty spooky one, though. Innsmouth no Yakata. It's a horror game where you enter this haunted house and- <laughs> What the f Sorry, I get spooked by jump scares really easily. So yeah, you walk around this house while a creepy monster flashes in front of your eyes every few seconds. It's really creepy, but if you actually manage to run into him, luckily you have a gun! and can shoot him dead. It's actually really interesting, albeit a little terrifying because I'm a big baby. Some games did try to utilize the VR gimmick, such as Red Alarm. Yeah, Red should be in the title of every game, like how the N64 added 64 to every title. It's a Star Fox clone, but a really, really crappy one. It looks unfinished, full of wireframes and unfinished textures. Go... Go jump off of a cliff. Surprisingly, here's one that I actually really enjoyed. Teleroboxer. You take control of some cool-looking anime robots and fight. And it's actually in first person, genuinely feeling like virtual reality. Or at least, kind of. Which, yeah, wasn't that the point of this entire console? It's super smooth and controls really well. Hitting your opponent is super satisfying, seeing all the lug nuts and screws pop out of them. If more games were like this, then maybe the console would have done well. But no, just like everything we've talked about previously, it sold terribly and was received as well as a fart in church. Not, not great. But hey, let me know your favorite or least favorite Nintendo console. Whether it be famous or obscure, Nintendo is proof that not everyone's perfect and everyone makes mistakes every now and then. But not every mistake is completely terrible. There's some good found in there. You see? I managed to make a positive out of this. High five! N no? Okay, fair enough. Bye!